16. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So be it. Good morning. Okay. I had to apologize to John, and I apologize to, yeah, Juan and Denise also, because I made them come over here last week. I got thinking about that. I didn't ask or anything. I just kept on until they came. Because we had the thing going on and we didn't have that many people. So it's glad to see it a little more balanced this time. But I thought about, let's see if they'll come over here. If we'll get out of our comfort zone. <laughs> hey, I'll cover you later. So let's start in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all the beautiful, wonderful things that you've given us. We thank you that you love us and that you continue to pour out grace upon grace upon grace. Sometimes we get distracted by the snowstorms and the darkness in our lives and we don't see the true light of Jesus. May we see that light and may we let our light shine before others that they may see our good works and glorify you, Lord. We just thank you for those that are here today. We pray for those that are away from the body. We just thank you for the unity that we have as the family of God. We thank you that for your spirit that is here today, Lord. And may we listen to your words, apply them to our lives, so that we can bring glory and honor to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your bulletins, I want to explain the one in case you don't understand it. It's got a Jesus and a greater sign. That means Jesus is greater than me. It's taken from the John 3.30 scripture that John says when he's asked, Are you the Messiah? And he says, No, I am not. And he says, In fact, it's my turn to decrease so that he must increase. And John was talking about that in his prominence and everything, but that verse needs to be applied so much to our lives. I need to take myself off the throne and realize it's not my will, that it's not my ways, but God's will, that it's His power living through me. Every day, and i got to get it back up here so I can point at it, I need to deny myself, take up my cross, whatever it is, and follow after Jesus Christ. That's what I'm called to do. That's what my life was purchased back to, to be. And... I've been doing where the praise and prayer notes are for you to take the, the notes and take them home and pray. And I woke up this morning when some of these other guys do at 5.30 and couldn't go back to sleep. So I spent time praying and stuff. And then I was like, you know, we didn't, hadn't changed this verse, but this verse really applies here. What, what my message is today or what God's message is. It says, therefore, since the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also ha have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did, but the message, that message of the cross, whether it's foolishness or it's wisdom, whether it's God's power leading to life or it's foolishness leading to death, that message that they heard was of no value to them. So I want you to think about that today as, as I'm talking and reading Scripture. What value that message of the cross has in your life? Because they did not share the faith of those who what? Obeyed. Those who did. Those who showed their faith by their works. So many times we forget that and we especially quote that verse that, that Merle read and we say, let your light shine, let your light shine, let your light shine. But we don't say the good works part because that's what people are going to see. <clears throat> This morning when I was reading, this scripture came up on my devotional. I'm going to read some from the Amp Bible today. 
And if you have problems with different translations of the Bible, come see me. We'll talk about them and everything. But the King James is not the only way. There are others, and there are reasons for that. And this is written where it expounds upon. It's got like the commentary built into the actual verses. So when we read about repentance, for example, in a verse like that, it will say that change of mind that should result in a change of heart, that should result in a change of behavior. It's in there in the Scriptures. So I read Philippians 1.9 in the NIV, and I was like, oh, that's good. You know. But then I read it in the Amplified Bible. It brought it more to life. And this was the Scripture from this morning. It says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more, and extend to its fullest development in knowledge and all keen insight, that your love may display itself in greater depth of acquaintance and more comprehensive discernment, so that you may surely learn to sense what is vital and approve and prize what is excellent and of real value recognizing the highest and the best and, the distinguished, and distinguishing the moral differences and that you may be untainted and pure and unerring and blameless so that with your heart sincere and certain, uns, uns, and, certain and unsold, you may approach the day of Christ, not stumbling nor causing others to stumble. May you abound in and be filled with the fruits of righteousness, of right standing with God and right doing, which comes through Jesus Christ, the anointed one of God, to honor and praise of God, that His glory may be both manifested and recognized. Now you've heard all that. That's Philippians 1, 9 through 11. Go back to what you're reading and look at the difference in that. Now, I'm not saying you need to go to the Amplified Bible or not the Amplified Bible. But I've been reading the Amplified Bible. I started in Matthew and I'm in Luke 6 or 7 now. So hold me accountable. Ask me where I'm at from time to time so that I don't fall short of that. Because we, we want to start out blazing, but then we kind of get distracted with things sometimes. And it's really... I've really enjoyed reading it. So there's nothing wrong with reading different translations it's, if the message is the same. And I'm going to read some from that today to bring some enlightenment there. This morning's scripture was from Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16, and I've entitled this message, or God entitled it again, Becoming Less So That Jesus Can Become More. And what I mean there is in our lives, in our daily walk. Last week I said, what are you going to do with it? That was the title. And I didn't really answer it, and I cut it short a little bit because I didn't know what Jacob would have to say when I let him talk from, the, from his walk experience. And I was very thrilled, and we'll mention more about that today, that the last song we just put down special, and we've got special down today, so I don't know what they've got planned or not planned either, but that he brought that to each of you. Because what I thought he was going to do was he was going to sing himself. And it was his intentions the whole time of bringing his family in so that we could sing the songs that he is accustomed to and stuff. Because see, we forget that so many times. We see the little kids and we, we gladly sing the little kids songs and excited about it. But we see this generation that's missing but coming back in this church. Praise God! And we don't want to get a part of their music and their songs. We're alienated from them. And please forgive us for that. You're the only two in here right now because the others are out wherever. So, so I'm looking at you. Praise God that they're here and we see the new life development, developing. And when I think about it, all I do is think about Scripture and the promises that God gave and, and the blessings that we have through these generations. God is an awesome God and wants such wonderful things for us. And if we're not realizing them, it's just because we haven't realized His Spirit in us taking us to those levels of life here so that when we reach glory, we're working towards that, that future glorification. <clears throat> the scripture last week was from 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 23, and I had Merle stop in the middle of 23. I want to read on now and finish reading that passage. So 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you, or teach you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other, which is just like we're studying in Corinthians, where that unity, which that church lacked. And we urge you, they've asked and now they've urged, brothers and sisters, you who proclaim to know Jesus Christ, 
Warn those who are idle. Warn those who are disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but instead the opposite. Always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. So we can't just apply that to the church. Paul wrote that in there so we know that that applies to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. And we pray, Thy will be done and Thy kingdom come, but do we really mean it? This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. You can apply that however you want to, but the Spirit of God lives inside of you to guide you through every step of this Christian walk, this new life that you have in Christ, this light that you have to the world. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. And that's where Merle stopped. That sanctification process, well, the whole process, from creation to glorification for all of eternity, it's God all the way through. God, 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 not you. Through Jesus Christ, through the power of His Spirit in your life. Not that I'm going to try to do this or that, but I'm going to become less so that Christ can become more in me by the power of God's Spirit. So I have to remember daily to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after Him. It's God doing it all the way through. We don't have to. What a joy to think about it. God will do it if we just let Him. And He is, Paul writes here, the God of peace. <sighs> so that when I face whatever it is in life, when I don't think I'm equipped, when I don't have the courage, God brings me peace. True peace. It's not coincidental that those words are written in there. The peace that surpasses all understanding, as Scripture says. And He's the one that will sanctify you through and through and through and through. Now here's the rest. May your whole spirit, what you worship God with, your whole soul, the actual life that He's given you, and your body that I physically do these things, that, that my body is used, that my body is His temple... Be kept blameless. Now again, that's not for me to do. Blameless means without blame. The only one who can blame me is God above because He's the one that I've sent to and accountable for. He doesn't hold me blameless because I have faith and total trust in Jesus Christ. Not because I have head knowledge, but because I have heart knowledge which changes my actions and behaviors because the Spirit of God lives in me. I am born again. He does it all. Be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, what a wonderful verse. The one who calls you, God, is faithful, and He will do it. Not you, He will. So I have to become less so that He can become more. He's the one that does it. Praise be to God. So last week I said, what am I going to do with it? Well, I'll answer that this week. I'm going to become less. I'm going to devote myself more to prayer and, and things. And the Spirit woke me up this morning because I normally spend five, ten minutes in prayer. And I spent a lot more this morning because I had a lot more time to get ready. And you didn't see me. I wasn't bothering you. Now, when I did come down, she's like, what are you doing down here? <laughs> but I said, you equip me for the day. You teach me. You guide me. Get me out of the way. And I kept thinking of that greater sign that was on this that I'm at the other end of it. He is greater, I am less. And the more I become less, the greater difference there'll be so people can see God instead of me. So turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. And again, I don't like quoting John 3, 16 without reading John. That's just me, without reading John 3. Because there's so much there, the beginning and after that verse that you need to comprehend. So I'm going to start in verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, remember he's the religious leader of that time. If anybody had it figured out, if he was the regular church goer, it was him. Okay? He was named Nicodemus, which means the conqueror. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council and he came to Jesus at 
night, very significant. He did not come out in the light. He stayed in the darkness. And he said, Rabbi, or great teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. We recognize that. So what are you going to do with that? For no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, strange reply because he hasn't even asked a question, but Jesus gets to the point of the issue. Very truly I tell you, you can no, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's room to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. How are you going to worship God in spirit and truth if you don't let the spirit guide you and lead you in your life? Let's skip down to verse 16. Now, I don't know what Bible you have, but we'll go back to the translations again. They're different translations, but yours may be in red letter, and yours may be in black letter if you have red letter. It's because we don't know if these are Jesus' words or John's words. We're not really sure. I think they're more John's words because the wording's a little different, but I don't know, and it doesn't change what the, the words are there. It doesn't change the meaning of the text whoever said it. So we can debate on these trivial things, but Paul told us not to do that. He said to concentrate on the message of the cross. This is the message of the cross. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God, the first time, did not send His Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict, Nicodemus. This is the verdict. You can insert your name. Light has come into the world. What have you done with that light in your life? Because see, but... <clears throat> people loved darkness instead of light. That's still the problem with the world today. We don't want to say it is. We want to make excuses. But we don't want this light exposing everything, our weaknesses, our sins. We don't think we can do it, which again is saying God doesn't have the power. So it's, it, it's basically a sin. Because we're saying that Christ's death on the cross was not sufficient. That the power of God living in me is not enough. That's the excuses we're making. People love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Now, is he not talking exactly to Nicodemus? And is he not talking exactly to you and I? Before we ever came to know Christ and still in our lives when we make excuses. Verse 21, but whoever lives by the truth comes to the light, comes into the light so that it may be seen clearly or plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Now here's how the NLT puts it, to give you just a little more perspective on that verse. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. The Amplified Bible says, For every wrongdoer hates the light and does not come to the light but shrinks from it. They add that part in for fear that his sinfulness and worthless activities will be exposed and condemned. So how is the light shining in your life? There's no problem with the light. It's how we magnify that light. When I looked up that verse to get the pictures for the bulletin, I looked up Matthew 5, 28, whichever verse it is right now, 26, whatever, go let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There's... Images of the verses, of course. And there's all kind of images of light bulbs, lighthouses, not one image of somebody doing an act of service with a light. We keep forgetting that part. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, body, and soul, and to love our neighbor. And how are they going to know we love them unless we're doing, if we're not the hands and feet, if we're not the salt of the world that brings preservative and flavor to this world. And if we're not, then it's worthless, the salt is, 
It's not good for anything but to be trampled underfoot. This is what Jesus is calling us to do in this world. <clears throat> Reading on in verse 22, After this, Jesus and His disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where He spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem, because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument. Didn't Paul say, let there be no divisions? These are among the believers. An argument. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, and that's the verse we should be memorizing, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought perfectly tied together, cohesive, like your body should be so that it could function properly. But instead, there was an argument. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. So what did John do? He addressed the division, just like Paul addresses the division in Corinthians. And to this John replied, verse 27, A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am, sending, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. Are you seeing what all Jesus is telling Nicodemus? That he's got to come out of the light if, if he's going to truly believe this head knowledge is not enough. Faith without works is dead. The New Living Translation says he must become greater and greater, increasing, and I must become less and less. I like that. Because it shows that continual that I need to do that every single day and concentrate on that. If you go over a chapter later, John writes these words in John chapter 7, starting in verse 25. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, Isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Talking about Jesus. Here he is speaking publicly, and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that He is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes out, no one will, will know where He is from. Then Jesus, still, then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but He who sent me is true. You do not know Him, but I know Him because I am from Him and He sent me. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour has not yet come. Still many in the crowd believed him. The whole purpose John writes his account is so that you might believe. Not so that you might believe and do nothing with it, but so that you might believe and become that light of the world. That you may show your faith through your deeds. Continuing verse 31, they said, When the Messiah comes, he will, perform more, will he perform more signs than this man? The truth lay right before them, but what are they going to do with it? The light had come into the world. But the verdict is, if you don't come out of the light, you love darkness more because you don't want your deeds exposed. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about Him. Then the chief priests and Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest Him. Jesus said, I am with you only for a short time, and then I am going to, to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people, will, people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Now let me set it up for you. This is at the Feast of the Tabernacles. And at this point, what's going on 
As the priest is dressed all in his robes and everything, he's going down to the pool of Siloam with his, with his golden vase and everything. He's bringing back water. The Feast of the Tabernacles is so that they can remember their wilderness wandering and how God provided manna from heaven, but also water coming out of the rock. Which even the rock became a stumbling block, if you remember, because Moses struck the rock twice instead of speaking to it. Because it was supposed to be a sign of the true rock that gives springs of living water. Oop, that's our name, isn't it? Ha, 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 what we're supposed to do. And the priest is bringing back the water, and he's going to say, With joy shall ye draw out of the wells of salvation. But before he can do that, this man named Jesus stood up, verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and he's saying, I am that spiritual rock that all of this festival is about. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes puts their total trust, confidence, and faith in me. As scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow. Not might flow, but will flow from within them we will flow out the Spirit so that others may see our good works and glorify God our Father in heaven. Verse 39, he's pretty clear. By this he meant the Spirit. So going back to 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 24, it said in 24, The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. It said in verse 19, Do not quench the Spirit. These waters of living water can't flow out of you if you don't let God do it through His Spirit. You don't have to do it. Quit struggling with that. If you know Jesus Christ, if you believe in Him and you have the justification, if you have been sanctified, set apart, and made holy, He'll do the rest. He'll do the Christian walk for you. Wow! Now, does that mean that I don't participate at all? No. I still have a choice each day, and I've got to put that up there because I want to point to it, to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow in His footsteps, in His ways, in His teachings. And then we can go back to His teachings and see what they were. So that our whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 3 through 6 says, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Partnership in the gospel. We have that privilege to do that and we have that obligation. Verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now back to John 7, let's, let's finish seeing what happened there. So on the last and greatest day of the festival, I'm starting in 37 again, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow. By this he meant his, from within them. By this he meant his spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. We have. That happened at Pentecost. Every believer receives the Spirit of God. They are totally equipped, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, before he gets into anything else. He says, you have every spiritual gift from God your Father in heaven again. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing His words, some of the people said, surely this man is a prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. Still others ask, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided. Well, we're right back. Wherever you turn in Scripture, you get the same things, the same problems. We are sinful creatures. We sit here and continue to be divided and stuff. Even after we're saved, when we just need to let God take care of saving us and walking us through this Christian life. It's right there in Scripture. We need to decide that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one, and let Him reign in our life through the Spirit. 
Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Verse 44, So some wanted to seize Him, but no one laid a hand on Him. Finally the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring Him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean He has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in Him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law... There is a curse on them. Now, who does it say next? Because he's struggling with what he's going to do. He's struggling with who this Jesus is. He's not yet stepped out of the darkness into the light. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, the same one who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was one of their own number, we know he was a Pharisee, asked, Does your law condemn a man without first hearing him? To, and find out what he has been doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee also? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet doesn't come from Galilee. Now maybe your Bible skips this next section, and the reason I kind of bring up some of these things is so that you don't worry about it. There are no discrepancies in the Word of God. Are there discrepancies in some of the translations? Yes, there are. And the more that we get knowledge, the more that hopefully we can correct those. You, if your Bible skips to John chapter 8, verse 12, it's because earlier manuscripts that we have don't have these verses. And if you read straight through that, ignoring the chapters and stuff, again, you'll be like, that kind of seems out of place. Because when you get to verse 12, it's a continuation of where we were. When Jesus spoke again to the people, Okay? And we're not just leaving behind the other, but it's another for another day. When Jesus spoke again to the people, He said, I am the light of the world. This is continuing that conversation we were just in. Maybe that other section's out of place. I don't know. It does not discredit the Word of God. It doesn't go against anything. But if your Bible has it, a note, it tells you that earlier manuscripts don't have those. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me follows, comes after, forgets his own life, his own things. The disciples left their nets, never look behind and follows Jesus. Jesus also says that if you take your hand off of the plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Once you leave and go to pursue Christ and follow after Him, that should be the only thing that matters in your life. If you do that, you will never walk in darkness, but instead will have the light of life. Jesus also said, I have come to bring life and so that you would have it abundantly. The New Living Translation says it this way, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You see what all Nicodemus is confronting here? And it's the same as any one of us because that's what we face. If you know Jesus Christ, if you put your faith in Him, then, then you are God's child. You are set apart and made holy, but it's still God's will that you walk through this life ever increasing to become more and more and more like Christ until you reach that point. And to do that, we have to get in that relationship. We have to feed off of God's Word. We have to pray, but we also have to do. Luke 9, 23. That's the verse I'm quoting. The New Living Translation says it this way, Then he said to the crowd, If any one of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross daily and follow me. The Amplified Bible says it this way, And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself, set aside his selfish interests, Take up his cross daily, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. And follow me, believing in me, confer confirming to my, conforming to my example in living, and if need, suffering, or perhaps dying because of your faith in me. Wow, that's what that means. And before they were ever called Christians, Jesus called them disciples, brothers, and friends. Because we've become in a relationship with Him 
And he said, it's even better for me to live so that the Spirit can come upon you and lead you through this world. I won't be with you every step of the way in physical body. But God will be with you and never forsake you and nothing can separate you from the love of God. Luke goes on to write these words five chapters later, Luke 14, 27. I'll read the NLT first. And if you don't carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Maybe you're fooling yourself. I don't know what the circumstance is, but I know what Jesus' words are. The Amplified Bible in Luke 14, 27, whoever does not carry his own cross expresses a willingness to endure whatever may come and follow after me, believing in me, conforming to my example, and living and, and if needs, suffering or perhaps dying because of me. Whoever does not carry his own cross, it tells you those same things again, cannot be my disciple. The whole process. Not shrinking back. Because see, and Merle and I talk about this. How, how did this person show this faith? How could they forgive someone who came in and, and killed their children and their families in church? Where were you, God. But the Spirit gives them the power to forgive. That, where else can that come from? And that's an act, forgiving the other person. So the other person is confronted with that. Not just confronted with this, but confronted with the changed life there that this person could forgive me. There's one story that I read about where somebody, and I can't tell you any more than that, the child was, was killed the guy stayed with the killer through, he was a juvenile, through his jail sentence time, whatever time it was, and adopted him after he came back as his own child. I cannot fathom that. But he came to Christ because of the person's works and deeds, not because of his preaching at him or his hypocrisy or his pointing fingers, but because of his words. Matthew 14, chapter Chapter 4, verse 16 through 20 says, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From this time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, change your way of thinking so that it affects your behavior, your heart, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting nets into the lake, for they were fishermen. That's what their occupation was. We all have our occupations. We can't leave our occupations. And I'm not saying Jesus is going to call you off to a foreign land. I'm saying be the light you are and let your good deeds show where you're at until he calls you differently if that happens. But he said to them, verse 19, Come. Follow after me, forsaking everything else, even to death, if that's what it takes. And they understood that. And I will send you out, instead of fishing for fish, to fish for people, for souls, for all of eternity. <coughs> At once they left their nets and followed him. If you didn't get to see the movie Friday, we watched I Am Not Ashamed. It was about the Columbine High School shooting.